talk about that. That's what, that's what you, hey, you, 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 you're, you're a bouncer on Main Street, you know, or a friend of, I want to see you get shot in the back of the head. But I want to do it to it. I want to start with you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Yeah, he's in Rio de Janeiro, you know what I mean? Okay, I didn't get who that name of it is. Yeah, that is Blanchette. You know, he (laughs) plays a fictitious, he's really real, but, you know, you never know if the story is fictitious or not. Yeah. He's all real. But that's his album. He's the OG. He's a real one. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we have an awesome show for you today. And we actually have a resident expert. We have an expert right here in the city of New Orleans, uh, an issue we've been dealing with, and that is human trafficking, uh, modern-day slavery of today, just like there was slavery uh, for 400 years. Uh, we still have it going on today. Uh, so we have uh, a great guest. We have Dr. Laura Murphy. She's assistant professor of English at Loyola University, and uh, she's uh, director of a program that deals with that. Tell us a little bit about um, yourself and the program, Dr. Murphy. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I am a professor of English, actually, at Loyola University, but my degree is in African and African American Studies, and I study um, the history of the transatlantic slave trade in Africa and the United States. And as I was studying that, I suddenly came across articles that made me convinced that there was slavery still today. And so my research focus shifted pretty pretty quickly, actually, um, because I became so compelled by uh, figuring out what it is exactly that's going on here uh, in the world today regarding slavery. And what I discovered um, through my reading was that there was 27 million people uh, in the world today who are enslaved. That's a conservative estimate. It's been vetted by researchers around the world. Um, 27 million people who are forced to work without pay, under threat of violence, with no means to escape. These are people you would call enslaved just as I would. And, um, and so I started working uh, with nonprofit organizations, just helping out as I as I could, I can write because I'm an English prof, so I, you know, helped folks out a little bit. Um, and then I started working with survivors of uh, slavery, both of labor uh, trafficking and, and of sex trafficking, uh, and started working with them. And they, many, many survivors are now um, have a like a lecture circuit, like Frederick Douglass went on a lecture lecture circuit. Circuit. These folks are out there on the streets, out in front of university campuses, out uh, in church groups, telling people about the nature of slavery today, and so I work to support their work. Fantastic. Um, I think, and, and I remember reading the bio uh, before, and I, mm-hmm. I, I called my daughter, I was, I was like, my God, so she's a professor of um, uh, study of African and African American history and, and, the, and the slave trade. Yeah. And I look, and I say, wow, we have to talk to her. <laughs> How'd that happen? And, and with your passion behind, yeah. obviously, dif- disenfranchised individuals and the powerful destroying the weak. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm. Thank you for your interest. I'm glad you you uh, saw that and told your daughter about it. But I, you know, because I grew up here. I grew up. I grew up on the West Bank. I didn't grow up in New Orleans precisely. I grew up in Luling, and uh, and you know, when I was growing up there, you know, a little white girl, seventh grade, learning about our American history, learning about slavery, learning about the South and our history of racial oppression, I always thought, well, I would have been one of the good guys, right? I would have been the one who was, you know, knocking down doors, saving people, fighting with my parents. I was looking for any reason to fight my parents at the time. (laughs) And as they're fighting with my parents, they were clearly the bad guys, you know, they they would be the bad slaveholders and I would fight them and say, you know, oh, I'm an abolitionist. And, um, and, you know, it's just seventh grade, you know, imagination of yourself. And then when I realized that, Today, there are all these people who are working in uh, coal mines, who are working in tomato fields, who are working in the sex industry, and who are being forced to work and can't leave. I thought, 
what am I doing today? You know, what, what am I doing to address this issue? And so I guess I just, I felt compelled. You know, I, I never felt like saving the whales or, you know, saving trees or anything like that. But something about this, I think partially because of my growing up in Louisiana, growing up going to plantations as a kid for school field trips where they told us that the servants protected the white, white people. You know, I, I never bought those mythologies. And I thought, how can we be not looking at this today? How are we building mythologies now about the nature of labor in our world, in our country, um, and, and, and that allow us to look away? And I promised myself I wouldn't look away anymore. Inspired. I, yeah. I am. <laughs> Literally, because the passion that's necessary to address this issue. Yeah. And so, uh, because people who are enslaved, by definition, can't help themselves. Mm. You know, I think that's, a, that's part of the mythology, too. I think that people are trapped in some ways. And people can be psychologically uh, convinced to stay in the situation they're in. People can be economically pressed so that there's no way that they can leave. There's no other sustenance for them. Uh, they're not being paid. They, you know, um, people can be uh, trapped by a legal system that does not recognize their status as being enslaved. But one thing I think we always have to say, and one thing I've learned from working with survivors, is that folks who are enslaved are powerful and strong and thoughtful and willful and are and and are agents of their own change and often find ways to free themselves i think we all want to be the the great hero who goes in and throws people over their shoulders like i was saying you know in ninth right. seventh grade or whatever right. i was imagining right. I, I think adults want to continue to be heroes they want to be liam neeson going in and saving those girls and taken right um, and and so we imagine people who are enslaved as being completely without will and completely without agency but the people i know fight back fight back time and time again, but they get held down, and eventually they find ways to get themselves free. Well, is that, that why they didn't want slaves to read? <laughs> well, you know, that's true. You know, every time there was a slave revolt in the 19th century, there was slave, it, it sparked other revolts. It made other people think, oh, we can do this, right? Um, and so uh, the, the scariest thing for a slaveholder is a slave revolt, is even a small one, even far away, even in Haiti, right? So. I think still that's uh, that's an issue going on today. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated, really, um, as a descendant of slaves. You know, to think about you know my ancestors, how could it work? So, all right, let's bring it to work. This is another show. We, <laughs> we can do this. that another day. We, we, we have to deal with it. You know what I mean? Just for whatever reason. Okay, human trafficking, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, give give us some context, worldwide context first, and then we'll come home. Right. Um, well, uh, in terms of the globe, we're talking 27 million people, as I said, and we're talking for every one person who is sex trafficked in the world, there are eight people who are labor trafficked in the world. And I think that this is this is a this is a surprise to most people. Most right. people in the U.S. hear about sex trafficking. It sells. It's a spectacle. It's on MSNBC. Liam Neeson is concerned about it. What you know? What, I keep right. hitting on <laughs> Liam Neeson. It's not fair. But um, <laughs> but you know that's what the movies are about. Okay. Right. And um, um, it's about sex trafficking, but in fact, there are many, many people around the globe who are um, who are in uh, debt bondage and brick kilns. People who are uh, child slaves in child soldiering. You've heard about that. Children who are working in mines in Tanzania to pull out tanzanite, and uh, people who mine the tantalum that goes into our computers. A lot of that is mined by people who are forced to work without pay. Um, so that kind of thing, domestic servitude, people who are held as um, as uh, you know, domestics, housekeeping people, nannies, all around the world. Um, these these people make up the majority of the folks who are uh, trapped in bondage uh, today. Um, in the United States, the majority we think are sex trafficking victims. Um, we, uh, but we still have a very serious problem with the other kinds of trafficking, people in uh, agricultural fields, people in domestic labor, uh, and then also people who are um, trafficked for sex. One thing, uh, one reason why other forms of uh, trafficking are happening other than sex trafficking in the United States is in part because of immigration. So people try to find ways to immigrate to the United States, both legally and illegally, and when they get here, they're vulnerable to exploitation. The thing that I think probably unites all, and I'm thinking, am I right about this? But I think the thing that unites most people who are uh, trafficked, who are enslaved today, is vulnerability in the labor market. 
right? Um, with the economic uh, situation being what it is, with half of the world's population living on two dollars and fifty cents a day, um, and most even even less than that. Uh, people are vulnerable to sketchy job offers. You know, I know when I was in college, I always say this to my students, when I was in college, I had a, this really, really sketchy job and the boss treated me really badly. The one thing that was okay about it was that I could leave. I could get up and go. I could quit that job. The people we're talking about today, they can't leave their jobs. If they leave their jobs, these people we're talking about who are trafficked, they are forced to do that work. And they are often held by violence, told if you leave, you will be killed, you saw this other person get killed, your family will be haunted. Um, and so they feel trapped in that situation. And I managed to get out of that really sketchy job that I um, got into, but it was hard because you're vulnerable when you don't have a lot of money. I still needed to pay my rent. Um, but I had options. I had places I could go to get other jobs. Um, yeah. Let's flip it around. Yeah. Okay. And I'll, I'll bring back and I'll, I'll call him out. Um, we had Clemmie Greenlee and the group from Eden House on a while ago. The whole thing. Uh, now, we got in an argument on the blog with this guy named Thaddeus Blanchett. He's some mm -hmm. guy from Rio de Janeiro. His argument was about every time we attempt to use uh, legal means to stop Sec, human sex trafficking, mm -hmm. that particular way, that uh, voluntary sex workers ended up being abused mm -hmm. and that there were very few people that were uh, actually trafficked. Mm -hmm. You know, there's very few people that were taken from Minnesota and so forth and brought down for the Sugar Bowl and Super Bowl mm -hmm. and, you know, in the Final Four and that type of thing. Uh, the other issue is that uh, this thing was is that what is wrong with um, sex work? Mm -hmm. So I think it all it, it gets kind of muddy, or does it? Well, I, I would say that, uh, and I don't know this this blogger um, yeah, yeah. Or, or commenter, but I would say that some of what he's saying is true, and some of it, what he's saying is probably exaggerated. Okay. Um, I do think that we run the risk in fighting human trafficking of uh, of having people who don't know precisely what they're talking about. Okay enacting the laws, enforcing the laws, and targeting, instead of people who are traffickers, people who are sex workers, voluntary sex workers. Okay. And I think that that is happening, and I think that it is happening in this city right now. Okay. Um, and I think that we need to be very careful to distinguish between people who are uh, uh, voluntary sex workers and people who are trafficked sex workers. Okay. By law, in this state, in the United States, and you know, in the globe, based on the UN's laws, we, um, or protocols, um, a person is trafficked when they are forced to do labor or compelled to labor through force, fraud, or coercion. Okay. And so when a person is um, found to be do performing sex work, right. what we need is for uh, police officers, law enforcement, to sensitively address and sensitively interview the person who's been uh, caught in the act, the person who's been uh, performing the sex work. Right whether it's a male or a female, to try to ascertain whether or not that person is, being, is doing the work through force, fraud, or coercion. This is not an easy job. This is not an easy job. People lie. People are, when they're being forced and coerced, they feel threatened. They don't wanna, they have been told, if you, if you say I'm f threatening you, um, you, I will hurt you, you will be punished. Um, it's not an easy thing, but I think we need to be doing more work to train, um, and there are people who do these trainings, uh, to train police officers to be sensitive to the signs of, that someone has been forced to do this work, and to, um, to recognize that those people are victims and not criminals. But there is a wide spectrum of choice, right? Um, there are people who are, who are clearly being forced, who are being held and locked up at night, and we know that we can say with all certainty, this person is being forced to do what they're doing. There are people who are, um, who are middle class folks who decide they enjoy sex and they want to perform sex work as a job and why not get paid for it? And they, we can say with pretty good certainty that those people are doing it by choice. In the middle, there is some, uh, some I guess, some gray area of people who um, are you know, in, in vulnerable economic situations 
who um, who perform sex work because they can't think of anything else. Sometimes we talk about survival sex, especially among runaway teenagers. They might not have a pimp forcing them to do the work, but they don't have any other way to manage to eat that day. Um, this is a this is a difficulty in the definition. This these are people who often fall through the cracks in being helped. Um, people who um, who have to take care of children, people who have to you know provide for themselves, provide medicine. These are these are people who sometimes are overlooked and they. They may not be being beaten down each day um, physically, literally, but they might be being beaten down each day by the economic circumstances that are systemically a problem in our country. Um, these are folks who typically fall through the cracks. And I'm not going to say, uh, I'm not going to tell a person, well, you say you're, you're volunteering to do this. I don't think you are. Um, if someone's being forced, the law has protocols to handle that. But there are people in the middle who I think are are indeed um, in need of all kinds of help, and I think that like this is a much this is another show as well. This okay. is the sort of systemic poverty that we have, you know, inequality that we have uh, in in the United States and around the world that um, needs to be addressed. But also, I think one way to address this is to be sure that whatever um, whatever. Uh, legislation we do write about trafficking um, that allows us to provide services for people who are victims of trafficking, that those services are not limited exclusively to people who are um, who are forced or ex limited exclusively to people who um, are are getting out of the of the life out of sex trap out of, of out of the sex industry during the Bush administration the the legal there were legal strictures within the Trafficking Victims Protection Act that said that no organization who um, received government funding through the Trafficking Victims Protection Act could do pro-sex work um, services. So that meant that any kind of harm reduction uh, strategies we might be able to provide to people who are not yet ready to get out of life or who might not yet recognize themselves as forced or who might not yet recognize themselves as exploited those services were restricted from uh, use for helping those folks. And I think we need to address that as well. When we do our definitions about what is trafficking, we have to keep a strict definition because there are a bunch of naysayers out there who say there's no such thing as trafficking. Right. And so we use tight definitions. We say only these folks here on this very forced end. But there are a whole slew of people who are vulnerable in our country, whether they're sex, traf sex uh, workers or not, that we need to address uh, and that are falling, definitely falling through the cracks in our social service system. I think it's a fantastic point. I think, uh, but I'm with you, the definitions, we have to deal with definitions yeah. on what we're talking about because yeah. on the flip side, uh, somebody would easily say that, that this middle class individual doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. they, they have such a small amount that in fact 95% are, they either range from those who, uh, this is the only way that they can survive mm -hmm. um, all the way through to those who um, uh, have mental health issues, all the way through to, to those who are actually forced by a pimp, mm -hmm. uh, but could leave, mm -hmm. you know, but to those who have a pimp that aren't allowed to leave. Do you know, the? it's just occurring to me as you're talking that one of the biggest, um, that, that this muddiness, as you call it, right. is part of what is paralyzing us in addressing the real problem of Got people it. who are being forced. Because it. right now, what I can get people to get together to talk about most avidly is domestic child sex trafficking. Got so it. United States minors in sex trafficking. Because we can all agree, we can all agree that we do not want kids under 17 years old being forced into prostitution. That Got is easy. easy. I feel like it's a checkbox. I feel right. like we Boom. almost don't even have to work on that. We just right. give you the information, right. you write the legislation, and we're done. Exactly. It's illegal in this country, it's easy. Right. And so people get around that because we can all agree on it. But this question of prostitution is something that um, that divides our, our human trafficking, uh, you know, fighting community, our, ab our new abolitionist community. It's one that divides it. And I'll tell you that there are days when I think, I'm going to just deal with labor trafficking because this is too complicated. People are pitted against each other. Right. But I think that what we all want is for people who are vulnerable in the labor market right. who turn to sex work, if we're just talking about sex trafficking for now, who turn to sex work to be free from harm, to be safe from people who will exploit them. And while it is still illegal in our country, 
If people are performing that work, we want to provide systems that help them reduce the amount of harm that they encounter in their lives. That's, That's it. I think we all That's need to it. get behind. That's it. That's that, it. I think we can all get That's behind. It. it doesn't matter if they're, you know, what happens to a child who is 16 years old um, and the day she turns or he turns 18 years old, 16 years old, she's trafficked. 18 years old, she's a, she's a prostitute. Right. You age out of services if we only pay attention to domestic minor sex trafficking victims. We need to pay attention to all these other folks who are falling through the cracks. We need, and I'm with you 100% because if we use that definition, mm -hmm. if we use that, that construct, the way in which to deal with it that way, that the only thing we want to do is help people and deliver them from harm, mm -hmm. harm reduction. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we tell somebody, we go straight to Bourbon Street. I always mm -hmm. say, let's go down to Bourbon Street. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to every girl. We did this one time. You go to, not every girl, but I mean, <laughs> you go right down the street. It's a long night. Yeah, long night. <laughs> but the, the, what, what, what you offer is, I'll offer you a way out, mm -hmm. okay? If you take this way out, obviously this is not what you want. Now, whether you were beat down and somebody had a gun to your head, mm -hmm or whether you were there because of psychological abuse or whether you were there because of economic oppression. Mm -hmm. But regardless that, what about these mothers and young kids and some on drugs? Mm -hmm. And if we do harm reduction, would we empty out Bourbon Street? I think a lot of people say we would. I say we would too. I think we have to be realistic though. There are not enough job opportunities for people in this country. And once people have um, done, you know, once people have quit school, been you know, trading sex um, for their lives, they start to feel like it's a dead end, like that sex is the only thing they know. So you might be able to convince somebody if you, you have a whole bunch of jobs in your pocket. But that's the point. <laughs> but, but when we say harm reduction, we mean right. we have to come with housing, you mm -hmm. have to come with jobs, you have to come with an actual legitimate way out. And the truth of the matter is not one of them would probably take it because they don't trust that it's true. Well, and I think that some, some, people, some people might still stay. I still believe and I know people who do this work because they enjoy it. Okay. But there are people who might step out. But I think that outreach efforts like that have to be sure to be comprehensive as you say, right. to actually provide uh, legitimate routes out that provide people with the means to, to really have a new life, training, job skills, school, training, things everything. like this. Right. And these models are working in the, the rest of the world. Hey. They're working in the rest of the world. <laughs> That's right. That's how you do uh, it, right? right here. But we also have to be sure not to be condescending and not to be uh, judgmental. Some people are in that work because they want to. Some people are in that work because they need to. None of them want to be judged. And I don't think we have the right to judge them, right? And so I think that I think that you know outreach efforts can feel judgmental. They can feel like people are also trading one thing for another. I'll trade you, you know, your job as a sex worker if you accept my Lord or you know whatever. People are trading, you know, God for sex work, you know. And I, I think that we have to say to people, we don't care who you are, we don't care where you come from or why you're here. If you want to have a different life. This, you know, this, you know, our social services network can provide you with the skills you need, the jobs you need to be able to get out. I agree 100%. And that's, what should, that's the way it should be. Basically, right. it should be saying, hey, I, 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 in fact, I'll use a theological example. Mm -hmm. I, the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. I'd say, hey, the only thing we want to do is offer you help. Mm -hmm. Nothing else in that's return. Right. Yeah. You want, hey, if you want more help, that's up to you. But first thing we want to do is allow you to be able to try something else. Right. I right. think that's fair. Is and that the way it's up to you? It's up to you. It's up to you. Because if, if without freedom, then we create another bondage. That's right. In, in fact, we create something actually worse. And people often don't know. They might not want to leave today, but they might want to leave in a few days or in a few years. And I think that we, um, you know, when uh, people I know who do really good outreach programs, like a woman named Tina Front, who works in uh, Virginia and D.C. area, she knows that. Outreach efforts can also endanger people who are being forced to uh, experience to work. that also. That's, That's right. right. They get beat up. They can get beat up for talking to you. And what are you talking to a cop? What are you talking? You know, what are you trying to do? You trying to get me in trouble? So she has some very. I'm not going to talk about what they are, but some very undercover, you know, uh, tactics for doing outreach, right? right. Um, and but that is also from someone who's a survivor who's lived the life. Right. to someone who's lived a life. And so she can also counsel them and say, look, you might not want to get out right now. You might, you might be in this. You might want to do this. But if you ever want to call, you ever get in trouble, you ever get beat down, you call me. But isn't right. that best practices, though, that it's undercover? You would think so. Anywhere in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. watch this. 
The same thing for slavery. If we, if we go back to Frederick Douglass, let's go all the way back to 400 years of slavery. Isn't, aren't we dealing with the same thing, whether it's human trafficking, sex trafficking? Mm-hmm. Aren't we dealing with the abuse of an individual, the powerful, dealing That's with right. the weak? The exploitation. And like you said, the exploitation of an individual, but also uh, the answer is always educating the individual about the choices so they can be empowered. As you said, it's not like they're totally um, powerless, right. they have to recognize the power that's within them. Well, you know, the one thing I would say that's different about this, uh, you know, 21st century slavery is something you pointed to before, and that is that people don't believe slavery exists today. Got it. And in the, in the 19th century, Frederick Douglass could stand up on a stage right. and say to you, I was a slave. Right. And no one would doubt that he had been a slave. They might doubt that he was smart. They might doubt that, you know, they might doubt all kinds of things about his abilities. Right. But they're not going to doubt that he was a slave because we knew what slavery was. It was legal. It was, you know, codified. uh, It was racialized. So his race alone told you that story. But uh, today, people who stand up to testify to say they were slaves, they have all these people who are naysayers who will come at them and say, this is not a real thing. This is a myth. And um, and in some ways, you can understand why some people might want to protect their own uh, their own, you know, sex worker, you know, their own lifestyles. But we're talking about people who really have been enslaved and they have to justify, they have to define it, they have to make legible this thing that we don't know about. And people attack them for saying that it's slavery. I think a real issue though is that to compare the slave trade from before to labor, uh, slavery in the labor market Mm -hmm. in addition to human sex trafficking Mm -hmm. because the, uh, the slave trade that was racial becomes dealing with a genetic issue, Mm -hmm. uh, a so-called genetic issue, attacking somebody's actually genetic makeup. Um, That's something that there's no way that they can get out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, In other words, there's a difference. Right. And I think that needs to be recognized. Your thoughts? Well, and I think I, I mean I think what you're pointing to is racial, uh, you know, racial yeah, bias racial. that people believe that ra- certain races had certain capacities. Yeah, because when you add, yeah, you put those two together, and then you have something a whole lot more explosive right. than just purely exploitation of an individual, but right. somebody who's exploited because of their entire race. Right. That means little kids grow up, you know, feeling exploited mm-hmm. before anybody does anything to them. Well, and I'll say that. In terms of uh, you know race, for the most part in the world today, race isn't the determinant of someone's status as being enslaved. However, it's not an insignificant um, factor. So, and I think that today, what we see in the United States in terms of um, immigrant enslavement, people who have been trafficked across borders, who are um, laborers here in the United States, who from South America or from the Middle East or whatever. Um, Our anxieties about immigration in this country, our inappropriate anxieties about immigration in this country, make it so that it can be racialized again. People can pay, can worry less about the lives, livelihood, sustenance of folks because they say, "Oh, they're they're immigrants. We don't, we don't have to take care of them." And so our responsibility, people think their responsibility is alleviated, but my responsibility is to every person on this planet. Real quick, if you can hit that camera, just a quick 15 seconds. The main point, I think, let's drive it home. Uh, yeah, well, I, one thing I want to mention is that I, uh, I'm the founder of the New Orleans Human Trafficking Working Group here in, the, in New Orleans. And we're working to have these conversations to figure out how to create good legislation here in New Orleans and in our country um, and how to bring together law enforcement, Uh, service providers, citizen activists, researchers to have data-driven, research-informed action here in our state. And um, that's really, that's why I'm here. Dr. Laura (laughs) Murphy, awesome. I think the main point is power. In any place, we have to empower people to be all that they should be. And I say take on anything that tries to take you down. Uh, Health Issues, Chris Sylvain, catch us on the web, healthissues2010.org. Thank you so much.